Welcome to the Rewriting Naruto series part 5, a series of videos where I rewrite the Naruto series, making changes to improve it for my personal taste. This is only part 5 of a long series of videos, so make sure you're subscribed to this channel so you don't miss any future videos in the rewrite. Also like this video to support the channel and the series. The new goal is 300 likes. If we reach 300 likes in 24 hours from the videos upload, I'll drop the next rewrite within the week. So if you want to see part 6 really soon, make sure you leave a like on the video. If you want to further support the channel, become a member and gain additional perks as well. Link in the description. We pick up with Jiraiya's first appearance after he knocked Iruka out. The weird thing about that scene in the original is that it seems like Jiraiya was there by coincidence and he doesn't seem to know Naruto or even care about him. Jiraiya is Naruto's godfather, so when he appears in the rewrite he will think, so this is Minato's son, huh? Jiraiya will still act aloof towards Naruto in the beginning and Naruto will still chase after him, asking for Jiraiya to train him. Jiraiya trying to get away from Naruto. In the original, we get the feeling that Jiraiya was actually trying to avoid Naruto, but here, it's more like Jiraiya is testing Naruto shinobi skills. Naruto convinces Jiraiya to train him by proving to him that he can think like a ninja, but Jiraiya only tells Naruto he'll train him after Naruto uses the sexy jutsu, just like in the original. Before they begin their training that they will eventually do in the original series as well, and before before Jiraiya undoes the seal Orochimaru used to lock the Nine Tails into Naruto, which disturbs his chakra and affects his chakra control, Jiraiya will put Naruto through a difficult test. Early in the morning, Jiraiya calls Naruto to a training ground. It's an open field with a forest nearby. Strangely, when Naruto shows up, he's not wearing his iconic Konoha headband. Jiraiya arrives quickly after Naruto and says, well, Today we'll see if you have what it takes to train under me, boy. If you don't pass today, if you don't show me what you're really made of, there's no point in me training you, so you better throw everything you have. Naruto swallows nervously. Jiraiya reaches for his back pocket, grabbing Naruto's headband and says, You call yourself a ninja, but you didn't even see when I snatched it from you. Naruto is surprised and touches his forehead as he realizes he's not wearing his headband. He gets upset and a little spooked by it because Jiraiya snuck up on him and he didn't realize at all. Jiraiya says, If I was an enemy, you would be dead. Naruto says, That's not fair. It's not a matter of fairness, and the life of a shinobi is hardly ever fair. You should know that much by now. Naruto gets quiet with a solemn expression and Jiraiya feels bad for him because Naruto's life really isn't fair more than most. Naruto Naruto focuses and regains his determination, saying, So what's this test you're talking about? You're a ninja. You can't be walking around without your headband. Your mission today is to retrieve it. Naruto says, I get it. Jiraiya turns his back towards Naruto, and Naruto sees an opportunity in there and tries to sneak up on Jiraiya, reaching for his own headband that's in Jiraiya's hand. When Naruto gets close to him and tries to snatch the headband from Jiraiya, the sage quickly turns around and kicks Naruto in the stomach, sending him flying away. Naruto falls to the ground moaning in pain. That's not fair! I told you already, the life of a shinobi is hardly ever fair, and you'll have to do better than that if you want to sneak up on me, but it wasn't a bad try. Naruto says, oh yeah? How about this? He uses the Shadow Clone Jutsu, creating five clones. He can't create as many now because he is nerfed by Orochimaru's Sealing Jutsu, but then, after his clones appear, all of them use the Sexy Jutsu. Jiraiya instantly spews blood from his nose, and the Naruto Sexy Clones rush towards him. Jiraiya screams, but well, that's not fair! The Naruto sexy clones reply in unison, The life of a shinobi is hardly ever fair! Jiraiya closes his eyes so he doesn't look at the sexy clones and uses the summoning jutsu. He summons the same toad he used to knock Iruka out. That toad is about 7 feet tall. Jiraiya says, Gamakitsu! 
Don't let the boy get the headband! I'm naming this Toad Gamakitsu, by the way. The Toad looks at the Naruto sexy clones and uses his large, long tongue to slap them, knocking them back and dispelling the clone jutsu and the sexy jutsu. The original Naruto falls to the ground and says, Wait! So I have to fight you and that toad? Jiraiya says, Don't be an idiot. You're not fighting me. You'd have no chance. Not that I think you have a chance against Gamakitsu anyway, but we'll see what happens. Jiraiya uses an Earth-style jutsu to create a small rock podium, and he lays Naruto's headband there. He then says, You have until midnight to retrieve your headband. Naruto says, I will believe it. Jiraiya thinks, well, Minato, let's see if the boy has guts. Naruto creates 10 shadow clones and thinks, oh man, I can't create that many of them. There's definitely something wrong with my chakra. He still rushes towards Gamakitsu, who's guarding the headband. Gamakitsu once again launches his tongue, extending it, and disposes of the Naruto clones pretty quickly as he slaps them and knocks them back. Naruto creates more clones, and the the same process happens time and time again. Jiraiya looks at Naruto and says, Boy, stupidity is thinking that doing the same thing over and over again will eventually yield different results. Naruto looks at Jiraiya and then looks at Gamakitsu. He then finally says, Fine, creating more shadow clones and assuming a flanking position around the podium. The clones rush in from different sides, but Gamakitsu is fast and his tongue is very fast as well. He he takes care of all the clones without too much difficulty, even though they try to pincer attack. Naruto tries tossing kunais and shurikens, but the toad easily blocks them with his arm bracers. Naruto then creates more clones. This time he throws smoke bombs around the podium and at the toad. He rushes in from within the smoke but the clones are destroyed one by one, even though they are concealed by the smoke. Jiraiya laughs and says, Not a bad try, but Gamakitsu's skin can sense vibrations in the air. Smoke or no smoke, he can sense where you are just as well. The real Naruto gets slapped by the toad's tongue again. We now get a montage of Naruto trying and failing to take his headband back over and over again as time passes. Jiraiya watches as Naruto gets completely exhausted. It's already dark now, late in the evening, and Naruto is getting close to his limit, when he eventually fails yet another attempt and falls to the ground in exhaustion. He thinks, I'm out of chakra, and I didn't even get close to the headband. That stupid frog. Naruto seems too tired to stand back up. Jiraiya sees that and says, Given up already? Naruto says, I tried everything, okay? Naruto tries once more to get up but stumbles back to the ground. Jiraiya grins and says, You know, your dad got his headband back in less than a minute. Naruto looks up in surprise. Jiraiya continues, Yeah. Minato was my student, the most brilliant I have ever had. He also wasn't a quitter. Naruto gets fired up, his gaze determined. He manages to stand up with a lot of difficulty. He then says, That idiot cannot even come close to me. I'll show you. I'll get this headband, even if it's the last thing I do. Jiraiya looks up. The moon is high up in the sky and he says, Well, then you better hurry up. I wager you have about five minutes till midnight. Naruto now motivated to show Jiraiya Jiraiya, he is better than his father, who he despises, gathers all his strength and gets up. He then looks to the forest that's very close by and runs towards it instead of running towards Gamakitsu. Jiraiya thinks, now let's see if you really are your father's son, boy. Of course, you were never supposed to pass this test. I just want to see if you have the guts not to give up and how you react to failure. Naruto hides in the forest. He sits down and catches his breath in the darkness. He then thinks, I think the frog can't sense the vibration so well in the forest with all those trees, I think. I guess that makes sense, right? Well, oh man, what would Sasuke do? Ah, oh, Naruto, come on, what are you thinking? Who cares about Sasuke and what he would do? Naruto has a flash of a memory of when Sasuke said the word decoy, 
when he told Sakura to use her genjutsu and disguise a kunai to make it appear as the scroll and function as a decoy for them in the forest of death. With that, Naruto has an idea. He thinks, I just have chakra for one more shadow clone jutsu, so this will have to work. We cut back to Jiraiya and Gamakitsu in the open field. Jiraiya thinks, what's he doing? There's only a minute left and he went to the forest. When is he coming back? Jiraiya hears Naruto screaming as he rushes out of the forest with four shadow clones. They are in a formation, the four shadow clones serving as frontliners and the original Naruto behind them. They are all screaming, I'll get the headband, pervy saint! Believe it! Jiraiya thinks, idiot, another frontal assault, it will never work! Naruto and his clones approach Gamakitsu who's guarding the stone podium where the headband rests. The toad launches his tongue once more towards them, striking all four shadow clones in one fluid motion. The real Naruto dodges and tosses a paper bomb kunai in Gamakitsu's direction. The toad is forced to jump away, which opens a path straight towards the podium. Naruto Naruto takes that chance and dashes towards it. We can see Naruto is dripping sweat due to his amazing effort. He gets within a few inches of the headband, reaching out with his hand to grab it. Gamakitsu's tongue wraps around Naruto's waist and he is tossed far away from the headband, landing once more on the ground, knocked prone. Jiraiya thinks, well, I suppose that wasn't the worst attempt. Naruto's body puffs, turning into smoke. A section of the ground next to the stone podium cracks, and the real Naruto erupts from it. His hands are a mess, bleeding. He lost all of his fingernails, but as he emerges, he snatches the headband from the podium and ties it around his head. Jiraiya looks at that, not believing his eyes. As Jiraiya is looking at Naruto's back, for an instant, he sees Minato's back in Naruto's, and for that instant, he's completely lost for words, and we can see he gets teary-eyed. He then thinks, Naruto went underground and dug a tunnel, wrecking his hands in the process so he could snatch the headband. He used the tunnel so that Gamakitsu wouldn't sense the air vibrations and wouldn't see him, and he made sure his shadow clones would shout very loudly so he could pinpoint the headband's location above ground. He had to dug that tunnel from the forest up until the podium, not something any ninja could do. Jiraiya smiles and keeps thinking, Minato, you've gotta be careful. Maybe this little guy will actually surpass you one day. Naruto turns towards Jiraiya and says, How about that, pervy sage? Jiraiya looks at him, hiding his excitement and pride at seeing Naruto's feet, and says with a nonplussed expression, You're out of time. You snatched the headband 15 seconds past midnight. Naruto's face drops instantly. But Jiraiya says, Well, I guess you did a decent job. I'll train you, boy. Naruto's breathing heavily, but he grins and says, And you'll see, I'll surpass the fourth Hokage in no time. Jiraiya laughs, The only thing you two have in common is your hair. Same time tomorrow morning, now go get some rest. This scene serves several different purposes. First, it establishes Naruto and Jiraiya's relationship, making them closer to each other from the get-go. Seeing Jiraiya's thoughts also shows that Jiraiya really cares for Naruto and wants to make him stronger. It also serves to make a connection between Jiraiya and Minato, and to show how the memory of Minato evokes powerful emotions in Naruto. Furthermore, the scene foreshadows how Naruto is eventually going to beat Neji in the tuning exams. I've always found Naruto digging that hole out of nowhere such an asshole, but if we see how he comes up with that idea and him doing that before the actual high stakes battle, that part of the fight feels much more organic. We can also see in this scene Naruto strategizing by himself and that he is far from being dumb. He's not a book smart guy, but he can think like a ninja. The rest of the training period remains the same as in the original, except that there will be another scene added. We cut to Hiruzen as he is overlooking the village on the rooftop of the Hokage office building. Jiraiya appears behind him and says, It's been a while, Sarutobi-sensei. Hiruzen looks at him and says, So you finally came back, huh? Are you done running away? Jiraiya looks ashamed and tries to change the subject. Orochimaru, do you know what he wants? Why is he attacking now, after all this time? Hiruzen replies, I don't know, Jiraiya. I thought you'd have a better guess. Jiraiya says, You know I could never figure that guy out. Neither did I. So, Naruto, how's he doing? 
Well, he's definitely something. Though, I wonder how powerful he would have been if Minato was around to train him. Hiruzen scoffs and says, You should have been the one that stayed around and trained him, Jiraiya, and you know that. Jiraiya looks even more ashamed now and says, I had important work to do. Hiruzen says, For 12 years. You spent 12 years sneaking in bathhouses and you couldn't return to the village even once? Jiraiya says, It's not as though you did much more for the boy. As far as I understand, he lived alone his entire life. Hiruzen says, Because he chose to. He doesn't like the Hokages because of what his dad did, so he never wanted me around. But it could have been different if you were around, Jiraiya. Jiraiya then says, I wasn't only sneaking into bathhouses. I've been very busy doing some actual work. Spying. You see, there's this organization called Akatsuki. And then Jiraiya goes on and debriefs Hiruzen about everything he found out about the Akatsuki, how they're going after the tail beast and how they assembled rogue ninjas from all around the world. Hiruzen looks at Jiraiya after he hears all the information. He doesn't seem surprised. And so you've returned to protect the boy, he says. Jiraiya replies, yes. He'll need protection, but he'll also need to learn how to protect himself. Hiruzen says, I guess, better late than never. It's good to see you again, Jiraiya. Good to see you too, Sarutobi Sensei. The rest of the training month goes the same, and the day of the final test of the tuning exams finally arrives. I am cutting a scene before that though. Naruto does not have that conversation with Hinata before he goes to the exam arena. Naruto was very nervous and unsure of himself before going to the battle with Neji, and that scene with Hinata dissolves that tension a little because Naruto feels much better about his chances after Hinata talks to him. Instead of that, we get a scene where Naruto is in the same place, reflecting about Neji's words and the upcoming fight with him, and Hinata observes from afar, not having the courage to approach him or say anything. Naruto isn't reassured by Hinata's words, and heads to the arena still uncertain of himself. When they all arrive in the arena, there's this small change that Ino is there because she won, and she's also informed that she will be advancing to the next round by default because her opponent didn't show up. They don't tell her what happened, but we know Gara killed Osu. Now I'll make some changes to the Naruto vs Neji fight. I personally don't like the way it was handled, especially having watched the entire series. In hindsight, Neji seems like a complete idiot, telling Naruto that his destiny was to be a loser, seeing that Naruto was the son of the fourth Hokage, the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, and the reincarnation of Ashura. So when Naruto proves Neji wrong that his destiny isn't setting stone by defeating him, he actually kinda confirms Neji's point, because, you know, Naruto was definitely much more special than Neji from the get-go. In the rewrite, Naruto and Sasuke are not reincarnations of anyone, but Naruto is still the son of the fourth Hokage and the Jinchuriki of the Ninetales, which definitely makes him someone. Not only that, but everyone in the village knows about these facts as well, including Neji. So it wouldn't make sense for Neji to challenge Naruto's worldview by saying he is a loser born out of nowhere. But I think I figured a simple fix to that. Neji will still be very much stuck in that idea of the immovable destiny. But instead of saying Naruto is destined to be a loser, Neji says that he is destined to be cursed and destroy those around him just like he's always done. Neji drives that in by saying that the Nine Tails killed the fourth Hokage, the Nine Tails Naruto embodies, and he was one of the best ninjas the village ever had. And no matter what Naruto does, he'll always be a threat to the village and hated by everyone. Naruto's arguments will remain the same, that no one is tied to their destiny, the predetermined destiny that they have, and that he will become the Hokage improved them all wrong. Having Neji tell Naruto that he is cursed parallels Neji himself who is cursed by the Hyuga ceiling mark. Neji also says that the demon inside Naruto will always be a problem because it cannot be controlled and the village would be much better off without him. That if he died, people would be relieved. The physical fight between them goes exactly the same. Naruto offers some resistance with the shadow clones, but Neji lands the 64 palms, rendering Naruto's chakra useless. After that happens, there's a change. Hinata stands up from the crowd and shouts to Naruto, Don't listen to him, Naruto! Don't give up! And this is the first time we ever see Hinata raising her voice. 
And everyone who's sitting around her, people who know her, they're very surprised by that. That scene mirrors the scene when Naruto did the same to Hinata when she was fighting Neji in the preliminaries. And that is what prompts Naruto to focus and gather the QB chakra to overcome his blocked chakra points. And we see that Naruto actually struggles to bring the QB chakra out because of the 64 pounds. It's not easy like in the original. And it's only because of Hinata's motivational words that Naruto is able to do so. Once he does that, he is confident that he will win the fight and his doubts vanish. Instead of that happening before the fight with Hinata and Naruto talking and all that. As the QB chakra oozes out of Naruto, some of the ninjas in the crowd recognize what Naruto is doing, tapping into the Ninetales chakra, and they start telling people around him who tell more people around them, and soon the entire arena knows what Naruto is doing, and people get terrified. Some people in the crowd scream in fear, others run away from the arena entirely, afraid that the Nine Tails might attack them and destroy everyone. Nevertheless, the fight against Neji goes exactly the same, and Naruto defeats him by digging that tunnel and punching him on the chin, just like it was foreshadowed with Naruto's training with Jiraiya. Instead of proving Neji wrong simply because Naruto defeats him, he proves Neji wrong because he defeats him and he's able to control the Nine Tails chakra, something Neji thought was predestined never to be controlled, and shows Neji that his curse was actually something he could use to his advantage. And that Naruto isn't bound by predetermined conditions from birth. When the fight ends, we see Hinata is very happy for Naruto, and we also see Kiba smiling, indicating that he actually started respecting Naruto after he lost to him and after Naruto beats Neji. Neji has the same change of heart he had in the original, but but the way it happens feels more cohesive with a narrative. I like Neji's arc, I just think the reasons for him disliking and challenging Naruto weren't correct in the original, so here everything is pretty similar, but Neji's motivations for being a prick make more sense. Instead of cheering and clapping for Naruto like in the original, the crowd in the arena boos him a lot, saying he's a monster and that that chakra was a cursed chakra that destroy their village once. Some people scream cheater to him as well. People didn't like that Naruto won the fight. Even though he may have convinced Neji to change his ways, he is still a long way to go to prove his worth to all the villagers. We can get a scene of Naruto showing his tongue to the crowd as though he doesn't care about being booed, but deep down, of course he does. The exams go on and not a lot changes. Konoha is attacked by the sand and the sound villages and things go largely the same. I'm only altering two battles during the Konoha Crush arc. The first one being Sasuke vs Gaara in the forest when Gaara was partially transformed into Shukaku. I am actually not really changing much here, I am more adding stuff to it. This fight is overall great, but the way it ends is pretty garbage in my opinion. So, Sasuke uses his third Chidori in the day, knowing he can only use two, and that using the third one may cause the curse mark to kill him. He goes with it anyway and lands the third Chidori on Gara. The scene when Sasuke lands on the tree branch after his Chidori is activated and the curse mark is flaring on him is one of the most badass hype scenes in the entire series. And then their fight ends? Like, what? In the anime, the music was already flaring up after Sasuke landed on that tree branch with a menacing expression, and the first time I watched it I thought, okay, now this fight is gonna get real, but no, Sasuke just collapses and then Naruto arrives. This is wrong! I was excited to see how Sasuke would fight with a curse mark. In the rewrite, Sasuke will actually use the power of the curse mark with that purple chakra to fight Gara. After Sasuke lands the third Chidori on Gara, Gara's sand arm is dismantled and he feels more pain. There will be more emphasis on how Gara is getting progressively hurt by Sasuke's Chidoris by showing more blood in his body. Gara will progress 
his Shukaku transformation and the sand will engulf his entire body. Just like when he did when Naruto arrived. But now he'll do that against Sasuke in CM1. And that will be an insane fight. Both fighters will be very fast, destroying the forest around them with Taijutsu. Gara launching himself around, Sasuke reacting with a showering gun and Lenny Taijutsu attacks, combos, and powerful punches and kicks. Gara will use the sand and the wind style from Shukaku, and Sasuke will also use fire style to counter it, clashing their powers, and Sasuke's fire will be more powerful now because he's amped by the curse mark. After a long exchange, Sasuke will use another Chidori, powered by the curse mark, and this time we'll see a glimpse of the Onyx Chidori. It's not a completely dark Chidori, but some of the lightning wisps are black. Sasuke then will land that Chidori in another of those clashes, cutting one of Gaara's sand arms again and reverting him back to the half-transformed state. And now, completely drained, the curse mark begins consuming Sasuke's body as he collapses. That's when Naruto arrives and his fight against Gaara ensues exactly the same way. The last changes I'm making will be to Hiruzen vs Orochimaru. It won't happen on the rooftop of the arena. That is too small of a battlefield in my opinion for that fight. They can have their initial exchange on the rooftop, but Hiruzen will jump down to the arena ground itself and they will continue to fight there. We can also add a scene of Orochimaru killing some Konoha Jonins and Chunins that were fighting in the arena, but Genma will not get killed. He'll just get away. When Hiruzen and Orochimaru are fighting on the arena grounds, the Sound 4 will jump out of their disguises and use the barrier in a much larger area so that no one can interfere with Orochimaru and Hiruzen fighting. So the battlefield is much larger now, it's the entire arena. And I find that kind of poetic that the third Hokage's last fight will be in the same spot the Ganons were fighting to become Chunins. Hiruzen and Orochimaru will fight some more there, and then Orochimaru will bring up the Edo Tensei. And this will work a little differently. Hiruzen doesn't try to stop the coffins from appearing because that's stupid and it's an anime only scene anyway. The coffins just come up and Orochimaru doesn't even try to bring the fourth Hokage because he would know it wouldn't work. When the coffins open up, showing Hashirama and Tobirama, Hiruzen will still be shocked at Orochimaru's evilness, like in the original, but he will also be terrified of having to fight them because he knows he is not nearly as strong as they are, especially Hashirama. Hiruzen asks, what did you do? Orochimaru says, Sarutobi sensei, I thought you would love this reunion with your old senseis, I thought you would thank me. Hiruzen, still perplexed, says, but how? How is this possible? I told you already. I will learn every jutsu in this world, and when I run out of jutsus to learn, I will invent all jutsus that can be created. This is one of my best creations, and that copies of the real thing that I can control. Sublime. Orochimaru, this is evil. You're just too narrow-minded, Sarutobi-sensei. Don't worry, though. The jutsu isn't perfect yet. They are not even close to their former powers, but they should still be fun to play around with. Yes, in this version, Orochimaru is the creator of the Edo Tensei, which I think aligns much better with the character himself, and I never really liked Tobira being the creator of the Jutsu. The Hokage fight begins, and now, as we have a larger battlefield, the scope of this fight will be much, much bigger. We should get a better sense as to what Kage level really is, one that is much more aligned to what we know at the end of the series. Hiruzen will have much more chakra here, he'll still not be in his prime by any chance, but he will be much more powerful. He will use his shadow clones and use many more jutsus, he'll of course use Enma and the staff as well, but he'll use those shadow clones as a parallel to how Naruto fights. Even though he's old, he's still able to create about a dozen or so, and all of those clones will all use very powerful jutsus, especially elemental jutsus and elemental jutsus from every 
every single nature transformation. Edo Hashirama and Edo Tobirama will also be more powerful. Obviously, they won't be even close to their prime, and Hiruzen will note that when he's fighting them. Unlike in the original, like he says, oh, they're as strong as I remember them. No, he will, in the rewrite, acknowledge that Hashirama, especially Hashirama and Tobirama as well, are not nearly as powerful as they were before. We'll still see Hashirama using the forced emergence to cover the entire arena in a few seconds, and Hiruzen using several blasting jutsus from all types of transformations with his clones to destroy as much wood as he can so he doesn't get killed by it. Tobirama will also use his flying thunder god on top of the water style jutsus, but he can't spam the flying thunder god because he is nerfed by the Edo Tensi, of course. But Hiruzen will have to use his clones as well to make sure Tobirama doesn't blitz him with it. Hashirama also uses a wood golem, not as large as the one he used against Mater, but still a powerful one. And then we can get Hiruzen using an earth golem and other massive elemental attacks to counter Hashirama's golem. Orochimaru also gets involved with the fight using his snakes and the Kusanagi sword to offend Hiruzen. The bottom line is that we get the same fight, but on a very heavy dose of steroids. Hiruzen should be on the defensive the entire time and the audience should think he could die at any moment. We get the same flashbacks and beats to the fight in the original, but it's just a grandier version to really get a sense of the power level of a Hokage. Eventually, when Hiruzen is beaten down and Rochimaru shows his female face, they'll have the same exchange they had in the original, but Hiruzen will ask another question. What is your final goal, Orochimaru? Why do all this? Power alone is meaningless. Orochimaru licks his lips with his large tongue and says to achieve the power of the one who created it all, to touch the power of the Sage of Six Paths. Hiruzen is surprised by that. You believe in legends now, Orochimaru? Have you gone mad? Foolish little sensei, the Sage of Six Paths was real. The one who created all chakra and spread it to the world. The one who carry the eyes of the samsara, the Renegon. Orochimaru says that with a craving and crazy expression. Now that you have much time left, and you would see its fruition, Sensei, but when I finally reach his godly powers, I'll make sure to recognize you as one of those who made it possible. The fight resumes and ends the same way, with Hiruzen sealing Hashirama, Tobirama and himself with a Reaper Death Seal and also sealing Orochimaru's arms. I think this is a good way to introduce the legend of the Sage of Six Paths earlier on and also make Orochimaru's motivations a little bit more interesting too. I've always thought Orochimaru had a god complex, and having him trying to achieve the power of the Sage of Six Paths is definitely something someone with a god complex would do. It would also make even more sense why he wants Sasuke and a powerful pair of Sharingan eyes so bad as well. I will change many things about the Sage of Six Paths in the rewrite, but I think the legend aspect should be introduced earlier than literally in the pain arc when he is first relevant relevant in the series. Everything else in the Konoha crushing arc goes exactly the same way. We have Hiruzen's funeral now, and obviously Konohamaru isn't there because he doesn't exist, but hopefully with the changes I made, Hiruzen's death will feel even more impactful as he had more of a personal relationship with Naruto, who will be devastated by his death. Even though he pretended he didn't like Hiruzen deep down, Hiruzen was a father figure to him and Naruto really respected him. We also see that Danzu attends Hiruzen's funeral. After the funeral scene is resolved, we get another scene with Danzo. He is talking to one of the Root Anbu members and says, It couldn't be better. Hiruzen is now out of the picture and Orochimaru is unable to threaten the village anymore. He smiles and thinks, Hiruzen, your sacrifice will ensure this village's prosperity. I'm glad you died that way, like a hero. You spared me the trouble of having to do it myself, and you delayed Orochimaru in the process. And now, everything will fall in place once I become the fifth 
Hokage. We cut to the scene when Itachi and Kisame are overlooking Konoha, just like in the original. The same dialogue happens when we see Itachi's Sharingan, ready to infiltrate Konoha. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, it helps me a lot, and definitely subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any future videos in the series. Also, watch part 6 right here if it's already out. Let me know in the comments below what are your thoughts about the changes I made, and thanks for watching.